peek what you're doing. Hi. Hi. I'm Alison. Hi, I'm Alida. Hi, Alida, what are you doing? I'm sending an SMS. What does your SMS say? It says, hey. Wait, I want to try to read it. Okay. <laughs> hey, keen for a cup of Java at Vida. Alida Chevalier is texting her husband. She says there's no reason why he shouldn't understand it. But she may be surprised to know that writing in numbers and letters is not that new. Would it surprise you to know that in 1867 there were already poems written like great? Like that. that is weird because I've just finished reading a book um, set in the 18th century and they've got YR for your in the letters they wrote and I was like, oh, how authentic is that? Well, this is uh, a, a Victorian um, piece of experimental poetry. It's called An Essay to Miss Catherine Jay. And the first few lines are, an essay now I mean to write to you, sweet Katie Jay, the girl without a parallel, the bell, of, I'm not sure what UTK is, I'm afraid. Roger Welsh lives in a world of books. He's the curator of an exhibition at London's British Library on the evolution of the English language. A contemporary piece of architecture, the library is home to 14 million books and students from all over the world use it as a resource. But Walsh is especially proud of this particular exhibit, which he calls emblematic poetry, all about numbers and letters. This is a book from 1867. And what's unusual about it is that, to our eye now, it looks very much like text speak. And I think this illustrates a really important part of the exhibition. What people also did was invent new ways of um, communicating, um, of being um, creative with the language. And it's such creativity that interests Rajend Mestri, professor of linguistics nearly 10,000 kilometers away at the University of Cape Town. We asked him what he thought of this use of letters and numbers and the link between Victorian poetry and what is known as SMS speak. It's a new freedom, but it's a freedom in a particular domain. I've hardly have students who write in SMS speak in their essays. They know they will fail, they know it's not appropriate, and they don't do it. If an entire essay were written in SMS, then one would have to examine that and see if it is really creative. It was, if it, the essay was about SMS speak and they wrote it in SMS, I would sort of really champion that uh, kind of creativity. In fact, Professor Mestri even sees a definite place for the use of slang in English. Yesterday's slang can become today's a word, there's no doubt about that, words like uh, being cool. A hundred years ago, cool was definitely slang. Today, it's merely informal. However, the professor believes that there are some places where slang shouldn't be used. Slang is a word that you would use with your friends, but never with your grandmother. If you use slang with your grandmother, there's something horribly wrong with that relationship. Slang has, has always been part of the language. Uh, there is dictionaries of slang that go back to the 17th century. In fact, we learnt in the modern flash dictionary that there had been an undercurrent of cool to Victorian English, leaving terms that still remain. Here, you might call somebody Flash Harry, which means there may be a kind of a man about town, um, Jack the Lad. They are, they're pretty cool, they dress well, uh, they know the good bars and restaurants. In other words, those who wanted to be part of the in crowd had to get their hands on this little book. There's a wonderful phrase here, all England are now slanging it. So and that was the cool way to speak. That was a cool way to speak, exactly. Possibly the opposite of cool was the original Old English. In fact, we wouldn't understand the earliest English speakers today. What? We gardena in yardagum. That's English as it was originally spoken, as recorded from the exhibition at the library. And if you thought it sounded Northern European, you'd be right. The English language didn't just grow up out of the earth. Interestingly enough, it developed from across the water in mainland Europe. What you had in England uh, were Celtic-speaking nations um, and some rulers who might have spoke uh, Latin around the time of the, the Roman invasion. You then had Anglo-Saxon settlers who came over from northern Germany, Denmark, um, Holland. They brought with them their uh, regional dialects and that evolved into Old English. English as we know it was still in its infancy. In fact, King Henry V in the 15th century was the first king known to write the language. Now, if, if the king was writing in English, is that, does that tell us that the people were speaking in English? Absolutely. Uh, the everyday people, um, the people who worked in the fields, uh, would have been speaking English. And the, the, the landed gentry might have been speaking French. 
Possibly the name most associated with English around the world is William Shakespeare. We put it to the test, speaking to random students on a university campus. Shakespeare, I think, ancient but very loved by most people. I did King Lear and it was very intense. His, his language is very complex. I've enjoyed some of his plays, but I, I couldn't really be able to comment properly. Did you ever quite understand it? Um, not without help, no. What was Shakespeare's impact on the English language? One can't exaggerate Shakespeare's influence on language. It is true that he has coined so many phrases and words and quotations like to be or not to be and so on. We paged through dictionaries that had an equally significant impact on world English. For example, the pronouncing dictionary was written with the specific aim of removing accents. It says here, rules to be observed by the natives of Scotland, Ireland and London for avoiding their respective peculiarities. This period of time, and many periods since, um, people have been um, concerned about their accent. They feel they might not be able to get them on in life or they want to sound like a certain um, type of kind of privileged English they might hear on the radio or the television. Which did strike a chord, because if anyone's aware of their accent, it's a South African. Humpty Dumpty sat on the oar. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men. Couldn't put Humpty together again. How do we South Africans rate as English speakers? From the perspective of someone from the planet Mars, they would say, well, English in South Africa is fairly interesting. It is fairly diverse, but quite different from British dialect. So we wouldn't confuse, let's say, the streets of Port Elizabeth with the streets of London. When we think of English, we think of the BBC, Shakespeare and the Queen. But in fact, English has travelled around the globe and is spoken by millions. The fact that people of all colours and nationalities speak English at all is quite possibly thanks to a very big book. This is the King James Bible, one of the most famous books in the English language. It was printed in 1611, so next year it'll be 400 years old. So this Bible is responsible pretty much for the English that is spoken throughout the world today? This was the one that was sent to every church in the country. It was also the one that missionaries took to the Caribbean, to Africa, to Australia. So it was the words and phrases from this book that spread throughout world English. And that's why we know lots of the phrases like an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. There's evidence that uh, the King James Bible was very influential here in South Africa. Uh, eminent writers uh, of the 19th century claimed to have been influenced by their missionary education. Among them was one Sol Plaiki a founder member of the early ANC who happened to translate Shakespeare into Tswana. He lived at a time when indigenous South African words were first absorbed into English. I always say to my students, in the beginning of such a dictionary, in the beginning was the word, and the word was aardvark. With a double A-R-D-V-A-R-K, this wonderful animal has made it not just to South African dictionaries, but to dictionaries worldwide. Add to English words from former colonies like Jamaica, India and Nigeria and you have a growing rich language with nothing to worry about because nothing needs fixing. For those people who try to fix the language and get very upset about the fact that things are changing, this shows that that process has always gone on. It will always evolve, it will always keep changing and all you can ever do is try to capture it um, and maybe celebrate it.